Richard Klein here with our next lesson in our chapter on African empires. We just talked about in our previous lesson the Ghana Empire. This time we're going to be talking about the Mali Empire. And one of the big things we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a guy who was so wealthy, he makes Scrooge McDuck right here look like a poor guy, okay? Plenty more gold than he could swim in. So let's go ahead and let's get talking about these guys. So how did the Mali Empire rise? That's our first big idea we're going to talk about. As the Ghana Empire weakened in a, around the year 1200, the other tribes around Ghana began to fight and began to take territory and towns and trade routes from them. And that's what we see in these successor states. So the Ghana Empire fell apart and you have all of these tribes fighting within each other. The one we're going to talk about is the one in the south called the Mali Empire. Under the leadership of Sundiata Kita, Okay, the Mali Empire managed to take control of the Ghana Empire and overrun them at the Battle of Kirina in the year 1234. That's right, the year 1234. Pretty easy to remember. With the former Great Empire of West Africa under their control, the Mali Empire grew to control all of the trade routes throughout the region and expand the wealth of the Mali rulers because that's what they wanted. They wanted to become wealthy. They took over the Ghana Empire. They took over the trade routes. They took over the cities. They got the money they want. And the Mali rulers, unlike the Ghana Empire, whose leaders were called the Ghana, which meant warriors, the Mali rulers had their own title. And it was the title of Mansa. Or emperor. The heads of the Mali Empire were known as Mansas. And before we go on, I want to go real quick and talk about the militaries of West Africa. Okay, and we have a couple of sculptures of African soldiers from this time. We're going to talk about it. This is a cavalryman. It's a guy riding a horse, obviously. And one thing you can notice about them is that the guy, the soldier on the horse, isn't wearing a lot of clothes. Okay, Armor and things like that weren't really important, mainly because it was really, really hot in the savanna and in the Sahel and even in areas of the desert. So it was more important to stay cool and things like that, as opposed to being in bulky armor like knights and stuff in Europe at around this time. And from here we see an archer, same thing. Okay, he's got his arrows and stuff in the back. He has some decorative things on him, but apart from that, no real armor. As a result of, you know, the lack of like a written language and things like that through the griots, which we talked about in the last lesson, we don't really have art or accounts of these soldiers and what they actually look like, more that we have these sculptures and things like that. That's how we know what they're from. One of the things that started with the Ghana Empire was Islam. And Islam takes a much greater importance within the Mali Empire as we move along. So let's go ahead and let's look at the second big idea, which is the relationship between Islam and the Mali Empire. Islam had spread through trade from the Sahara around the year 800s AD. Now remember, during the Ghana Empire, the capital had a Muslim area, and many Ghana Empire officials were Muslims. But the king themselves himself still worshipped their own native gods and their own native religions. This changed with the Mali Empire. When Musa Kita became Mansa in around the year 1310, he actually converted to Islam. He kind of believed it. He also the, believed the teachings of Islam. He also realized he could get good trade and better relations with the Muslim kingdoms to the north on the other side of the Sahara. So you know what? Let's just follow the same religion as they do. However, he still kept the traditional policy of the Ghana where if you had your own native religion, you could still worship it. So he didn't force them to do it outright. What he did, and successive Mali rulers did, was they built what were called mosques or Muslim places of worship throughout the empire and paid for imams. And by imams, we mean these are the Muslim teachers. The closest analog would be like a pastor of a Christian church or a rabbi of a synagogue to go around and preach Islam to the empire. And, you know, if people would convert, then there they would go. This happened a bit over time and they slowly converted to Islam because people would say, well, if the man is a Muslim, well, I just as soon do what he's doing and maybe he might give me favor or something like that. Now, we're going to really quick look at a mosque. This is the Mosque of Gene. Uh, it's in West Africa. It's still there. It's built in the 1300s. So this is an almost 800-year-old mosque. And it has the ag uh, architectural style of the Mali Empire. It's made of adobe, a lot like the Hopi and the Anasazi and the other uh, Native American tribes of uh, southwestern United States. 
Okay, the same concept, mud, and you have wooden beams, and they go around them. The wooden beams stick out for structural support, and as well, whenever the adobe needs to be reapplied and maintained, it gets a real easy place to put up the scaffolding. And this place is a World Heritage Site, and still, for nearly 800 years, they still have Muslim worship services. Obviously, all of that work going into mosque and training imams and all of that having to do with the spread of Islam in the Mali Empire, you had to get the money from somewhere. And like I said at the beginning, the Mali Empire was really, really wealthy. And what they did was a little bit different than the Ghana Empire. The Ghana Empire became wealthy mainly through taxing trade traveling through their territory. Uh, the salt traders and the gold traders would pass through and go to the trade center and they would just take their little cut off the top and they would make their money that way. The Mali Empire decided, you know what, we're just going to get rid of the middleman and we're going to just expand our borders and we're going to take over the gold mines and the salt mines to the south. Okay, so by doing that, the Mali Empire ended up controlling most of the trade between the Mediterranean and West Africa because they owned the salt and gold mines as well as the large trade centers, these huge cities of GNA and Timbuktu, as long as the other cities along that big bend in the Niger River that we talked about in the last lesson and where boats carried cargo between cities. So by controlling the trade centers and the location of the trade routes and the mines themselves, they controlled the entire economy of the region which we can see in this map. So we have GNA, we have Timbuktu, we have this city called Gao, which will come really important in the next lesson. We have Nayani, which is the capital of the Mali Empire, and all of this was under control. See those two huge gold mines there? Okay, those were the sources of the gold up toward the north, just into the Sahara Desert and stuff, were the salt mines. So the Mali Empire controlled all of that, and as a result, they became really, really wealthy. At its height, the Mali Empire actually owned the three largest gold mines in the entire Eastern Hemisphere. So as far as, you know, the Europeans and the Asians knew, the biggest sources of gold were actually in the Mali Empire. So these dudes were super wealthy. And every ounce of gold extracted was taxed, just like the Ghana Empire. All gold nuggets were kept by the Mansa himself. Remember? Gold that was found like this, the Mansa kept it for himself. On the other hand, in exchange, gold dust of equal weight was given and traded and used in currency. Remember this stuff? So if you had a gold nugget that was, let's say, a pound, you would turn it into the Mansa and he would give you a pound of gold dust for exchange because he liked keeping that because it was the easiest way to accumulate wealth for him. Salt was also mined in the north of the Mali Empire and it was cut into bricks and use this currency, like you can see right here. Same pictures from the last lesson. These were cut and to blocks and use this currency there, like I said. Further south in the gold fields, salt was actually worth equal to gold because it was so rare in the region, okay? So in these areas, there was no salt. So if you had salt and you had plenty of gold, what did you really need? You really needed salt. So the inverse of what we would think, salt, salt's cheap. Gold's really expensive. No, because salt over there was so rare. So like gold, salt was also taxed. You had to pay in, in chunks of salt or in gold dust with the money going directly to the Mansa. And as a result, he became really, really wealthy. And the wealthiest of all the Mansas we'll talk about in the next section. Whenever we talk about Mansas and African rulers, usually the most famous of the Mansas that we talk about is Mansa Musa Kita, who ruled from around 1310 to year 1337. Musa was a very devout Muslim who greatly expanded Islam in his empire. And this is a picture of him actually in an atlas that was in Spain. What do you notice about him? He's holding gold. Obviously, because he had all of this gold, he converted to Islam, he became a very devout Muslim, he expanded Islam all across his empire. He built mosques around the country, he created a madrasa, which is a Muslim university, in order to train the imams, remember that those are the Muslim teachers, and he sent them throughout his empire to set up mosques and stuff in cities and preach about Islam and had people convert, eventually, out of their own choosing from their own native religions to Islam. Like any good Muslim, he needed to fulfill the five pillars of Islam, one of whom was, a, of course, the Hajj, or the pilgrimage to Mecca. 
Now, for two years, from 1324 to 1326, Mansa Musa went with possibly thousands of men and millions of dollars of gold to Mecca. As far as the Muslims can, were concerned in Mecca, they were the wealthiest guys around. After all, every single Muslim went to them. Up rocks up this guy with like thousands of servants, millions of dollars worth of gold, who's made this long pilgrimage and he shows up and everyone is amazed by the wealth and power of the Mali Empire. A really quick story about Mansa Musa right here is that going there and coming back, he actually destroyed the entire economy of Egypt. That sounds rather crazy, but here's what happened. So he travels across the Sahara Desert and stuff, and he gets to Egypt. He's got all this gold. Well, he buys everything with gold. He has so much gold, and he gives it to the poor and stuff like that, that there was so much gold in Egypt suddenly that gold was pretty much worthless, and the entire economy crashed in Egypt. So he goes and he does his little hajj and he goes around the Kaaba and all that stuff. And on his way back, he finds out about that. So what he actually does on the way back, even though he's probably one of the richest men ever in history, he decides to take out loan from the Egyptian government, Egyptian people. He says, hey, I need gold, strangely enough. And he takes most of the gold back. In doing so, he ends up eventually paying it back in form of trade and stuff like that. But by taking the gold back, it restored the Egyptian economy because gold became rare again, and therefore it became valuable. So Mansa Musa was a really, really wealthy guy. He was a very devout Muslim, and in a really strange way, he actually wrecked the uh, Egyptian economy on the, on the way to his pilgrimage. And in the next session, we'll talk about what happened after Mansa Musa died. Like all good things, like the Ghana Empire, the Mali Empire in this lesson, the Songhai Empire in the next one, all good things have to come to an end. And Mansa Musa's show of wealth was not popular with the rest of the Mali government. They're like, you can't show all this stuff, Mansa Musa. Like, you can't. Because then, like, everyone will come and want our stuff. What happened was after Mansa Musa died, his successor was Mansa Suleiman Kita, actually reversed Musa's policy of spending money. In fact, he went the opposite way. He went back to Scrooge at the beginning. He became a miser, uh, according to one Islamic prince. He says how he goes and he meets Suleiman, and like Suleiman's got like all this gold and stuff like that, and he heads back to his uh, home where he's at, and they're saying, oh, the Mansa's sending you a gift, and he's like, ooh, what am I going to get? I'm going to get gold, I'm going to get jewelry, fine clothes. You know, he gives him some melons, and he's like, yay fruit okay and he accuses him of being a miser and a source as like you know you're so wealthy and you're not going to give up your gold you're just hoarding all the wealth Suleiman ended up being the last good ruler of the Mali empire and his sons and his successors from there kind of went in the complete opposite direction they went even beyond Mansa Musa showing off his wealth they just started spending money and through reckless economic policy the Mali Empire actually started going broke, despite owning pretty much all the gold in the Eastern Hemisphere. The Songhai tribe, who had been under the control of the Mali, ended up revolting and starting fighting. So just like the Ghana Empire, it fell apart with all these tribes. Once they stopped being strong, the same thing happened to the Mali. Okay, the Songhai tribe ended up becoming independent. And over time, the Songhai started picking off all these little trade routes and all of these, all of these cities who used to be under Mali control. Now, despite this, in the next lesson, you'll talk about, we'll talk about how the Songhai Empire became really big and really wealthy. But the Mali Empire somehow hung on, mainly through owning a couple of the gold mines still, until the 1600s when it itself broke up into smaller kingdoms. In fact, this is a spoiler for the next lesson. When we look right here, the Songhai Empire was actually really, really big and really, really wealthy, but the Mali Empire was still pretty big and kind of big on its own, but it didn't have anywhere near the wealth or power that it had under Mansa Musa or even Suleiman. So let's go ahead and let's wrap up this lesson. Let's create our graphic organizer. Let's talk about the basics of the Mali Empire. Same thing as last lesson. Let's look at location, how long they were around, the source of their wealth, the religion, or cause of collapse. Same location, West Africa along the Niger River. The length of its rule. Well, the Mali was around from around the year 1230 to around 1600, so about 400 years it lasted as an independent kingdom. The source of its wealth was the gold and the salt mines, okay? So not just trade, but actually owning the resources that were traded for. That's where they got their wealth from. The religion was a shift from native religions to Islam, mainly through Mansa Musa. 
okay, who funded for the mosque and the, the imams and the missionaries. And the cause of the collapse of the Mali Empire wasn't just bad rule, it was also overspending. And then once the little tribes started going off on their own, they couldn't control them and they kept on losing to them. So there you go. That's the lesson on the Mali Empire. We'll go in our next lesson. We'll talk about the last of the three empires, the Songhai Empire, who talked about wealth, who gained wealth and things like that over the same processes. So as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.